When we determine that a problem is NP-complete, we know that unless P equals NP, we can't expect to find a polynomial time algorithm. But that doesn't mean all hope is lost. It turns out that there are lots of things we can do to design algorithms for NP-complete problems. For one thing, all of our running time analyses and hardness proofs are about worst case instances. And so it might be the case that even though a problem is hard in the worst case, there are lots of examples that we can actually solve efficiently. And so we might be able to design algorithms that efficiently solve the most common instances and only struggle on a small subset of hard examples. Or we might be able to devise randomized algorithms that give us good solutions with high probability and only fail a small fraction of the time. Or for some problems, we might be okay with an approximate solution, and so we might be able to devise efficient algorithms that don't give us an optimal answer, but can get us provably close enough. And that leads us to the topic for this video. The field of approximation algorithms is gigantic. We could have an entire course or more dedicated to just that subject. And so this video will be a brief introduction to some of the easiest approaches to designing approximation algorithms and some of the ideas for proving how close they get to an optimal solution. So we'll cover two broad approaches to designing approximation algorithms. In the first approach, we'll design algorithms that are too simple to solve the NP-complete problem, but might get us close. And in the second approach, we'll swap in something easier instead of the NP-complete problem and use our solution to that simpler problem as an approximation to the related harder problem. For the first approach, consider yet another variant on scheduling problems. Here, we're given a set of jobs that each have some amount of time that they will take, and we have a set of machines that those jobs will run on, and we want to balance the load between those machines, meaning that we want to make the worst case load on any given machine as small as possible. This load balancing problem I've described is an optimization problem, but as usual, there is a natural decision problem variant where we give some threshold and we're asking, can the maximum load be below that threshold? And that decision problem is one you could prove is NP-complete. It's closely related to lots of other packing problems we've already seen, and so you could do a reduction from one of those packing problems to this one to show that the decision version of the problem is NP-hard, and if the decision problem is hard, then the optimization version is at least as hard. And so we shouldn't expect a polynomial time algorithm to be able to solve this exactly. But thinking back to other scheduling problems we've solved where we used greedy algorithms, maybe there's a greedy algorithm we could apply that will get us close enough to an optimal solution on load balancing. If we apply our general structure of a greedy algorithm, we're going to start by sorting all of the jobs according to some criterion. And then we'll go through each job in the sorted order and make a decision about what to do with that job, assigning it to some machine. In this case, our criterion will be to sort the jobs by decreasing time so that the longest jobs get considered first. And then for each job, we will assign it to whichever machine currently has the minimum load. And as we've done before with other greedy algorithms and incorrect orderings, you can come up with a collection of jobs and a number of machines where if we followed this greedy algorithm, we would not get the optimal load balance. But our goal here isn't to solve this problem optimally. Our goal instead is to think about how close does this get to an optimal solution, and is it a good enough approximation? So we can think about how bad is the worst case load this algorithm assigns to any machine, 
And how much worse is that than an optimal solution? And our approach here harkens back to one of the proof techniques we talked about for greedy algorithms of matching bounds, where for some greedy algorithms, a way to prove that they are optimal is to give a lower bound on the optimal solution and an upper bound on our solution. And if those bounds are the same, we know our algorithm is optimal. Here, our algorithm isn't optimal, so we won't be able to prove that those bounds match, but we can think about how close are those bounds and use that to give an approximation ratio for our algorithm. So let's think about the machine that ends up with the worst load when we run this algorithm. And specifically, let's think about when we assigned the last job to that machine, it presumably already had some other jobs assigned to it, but we know when we picked that machine, it was the one with the minimum load up to that point. And so we can think about all of the other jobs that this machine had already been assigned, and we can separately think about this last job that it got assigned, and if we can upper bound the total time of all those previous jobs, and upper bound the total time of this last job, then putting those two bounds together can give us an upper bound on the total load of this machine. And since we're thinking about the worst case machine, this will give us an upper bound on the imbalance from our greedy algorithm. So the easy one to start with is this last job. And we know that that job must be assigned to some machine. And so the overall worst case load under the optimal algorithm must be at least as large as the time to complete this job. But then if we think about all of the jobs that were previously assigned to this machine, the total amount of time for those jobs also has to be less than or equal to the worst case load for the optimal schedule. The reasoning here is that when we assigned job J, we picked machine I based on it having the smallest load up to that point. The machine with the smallest load necessarily has a load that is less than or equal to the average load across all of the machines. And the average load across all of the machines up to this point must be less than or equal to the maximum load in the optimal solution, because the optimal solution will have some worst case machine, and that machine's load must be at least the average load under the optimal solution, and the average load under the optimal solution must be at least the average load for the partial solution, because here we have not yet assigned all of the jobs. So the average load when we haven't yet assigned all of the jobs must be less than or equal to the average load later when we have assigned all of the jobs, and the average load when we've assigned all of the jobs must be less than or equal to the worst load when we've assigned all of the jobs, which is the cost of the optimal solution. So since the maximum load on any machine under the optimal solution must be at least the average load on any machine when all the jobs are assigned, and the minimum load at a given point before all of the jobs have been assigned is less than or equal to the average load at the end. So we know that the load on this machine before it got its last job must be less than or equal to the optimal solution. So since the two components of the load on machine i are both less than or equal to opt, that means machine i's total load is less than or equal to twice the optimal load. And since I was the machine with the worst load, that is the cost of our greedy solution. And so we know that the greedy algorithm gets us within a factor of two of the optimal solution. 
And so we say that this greedy algorithm has an approximation ratio of two, since it gets us within a factor of two of the optimal solution. Now of note, nowhere in my proof did I make reference to the fact that we sorted the jobs by decreasing length. And it turns out that if you take this into account, you can prove a tighter bound on the quality of the greedy solution, which in turn gives us a better approximation ratio analysis for this same greedy algorithm. But now turning to the second approach, sometimes we'll have an NP-complete problem that we don't know how to solve efficiently, but there's some related problem that we can solve efficiently. And so an approach to devising a greedy algorithm is to solve that related problem and use that to give us an approximate solution for the hard one. In the case of vertex cover, which we know is NP-complete, we can write down an integer linear program. The program has a variable for every vertex, and for every edge we have a constraint that says the two variables on either end of that edge must add up to at least one. And then we try to minimize the sum of all the variables to use as few vertices as possible. But we need to constrain the variables to be either zero or one, where zero represents the vertex not being in the cover, and one represents the vertex being part of the vertex cover. Note that we are once again solving an optimization problem here, and the problem that we know to be NP-complete is the decision version of vertex cover, where we're given some k and we're asking, is there a vertex cover of size k or smaller? But if we could efficiently solve this optimization version, that would let us efficiently solve the decision version of vertex cover, and so we don't expect this integer linear program to be efficiently solvable in general, unless p is equal to np. So instead, we can avoid solving the integer program, and instead solve a relaxation of the integer program that turns it into a closely related linear program. Our integer constraints say that every variable has to be either 0 or 1, and so if we turn this into a linear program, we'll replace these constraints with each variable being between 0 and 1. Now we have a linear program, but that linear program no longer exactly describes the vertex cover problem that we started with. So if we solve this linear program, we might get an answer that has fractional values for some of the variables. So we need a way of translating that linear program solution that we get into a vertex cover. And the key idea is to simply round the values we get back for each of our variables. If we round all of the variables, then we will end up selecting for the vertex cover all of the variables that had a value of at least a half when we solved the linear program. And the first question to ask is whether this rounding procedure actually gives us a valid vertex cover. Does it give us at least one end of every edge? And the answer is yes. If we have a solution to the linear program, then we know the values for all of the variables must satisfy all of the constraints. And since we have, for every edge, a constraint that the two variables have to add up to at least one, we know that at least one of these two variables must have a value that's at least a half. And so when we do the rounding, at least one of those vertices will end up in the vertex cover and so we will have succeeded in covering every edge. So then the question is, how big is the resulting vertex cover? Can we relate the number of vertices we get from this algorithm to the optimal number of vertices in the smallest possible vertex cover?
Well, if we think about the number of vertices in the vertex cover, since we rounded all of the variables, that means only variables that had a value of at least a half when we solved the linear program will get a value of one from the rounding. So the worst case number of vertices will result from all of the variables coming out to a half when we solve the linear program. And so if we rounded all of those variables up, then the number of vertices would be twice the objective that we got when we minimized in the linear program, since that objective was the sum of all the variables. And then the optimal value of the linear program is less than or equal to the optimal value of the original integer program. And we know that because anything that was a possible solution to the integer program is also a valid solution to the linear program. We've only relaxed the constraints by going from the set 0, 1 to the range from 0 to 1. And so it might be the case that solving the linear program gives us a smaller objective, but the objective we get from the linear program can only be better. And so if the size of our vertex cover is within a factor of 2 of the linear program's objective, which is less than or equal to the integer program's objective, then we know that the size of our vertex cover is, in the worst case, twice as large as the size of the optimal vertex cover. And so again, our approximation algorithm gives us a two approximation. The fact that we came up with an approximation ratio of two for both of these approximation algorithms is somewhat of a coincidence because we know that a better approximation ratio for this greedy algorithm is possible. But it's also somewhat a consequence of the fact that we have chosen particularly easy examples of approximation algorithms. Studying approximation algorithms in more depth will often come up with much more complicated algorithms, and we may end up with both better and worse approximation ratios that will often be even harder to prove. And in fact, there are some cases where we can prove that even coming up with an approximate answer is an NP-hard problem. But I hope this video has given you a bit of an idea of the sorts of approaches we can take to devising approximation algorithms and to analyzing how close they come to an optimal solution.